The wardrobe build is finally complete. I'm so sorry it's taken so long to post this video, but over the last few weeks, I've had 14 doors to make, prime and top coat twice. I've had 38 hinges to install, lighting to fix, and skirtings to scribe and install. And because of all this, in my ill discipline and fear of missing something, I've had over 300 video clips to wade through to put this video together. And this couldn't have happened soon enough because since I ripped out the old wardrobe in July 2019, our clothes have been stored in the old bathroom and the garage. So in today's video, I'm going to be running through the door construction, hinge installation, doorknobs, lighting issues, plinth skirting, and finally repainting. But before I start, I've taken the rare step today of bringing in a sponsorship for this video. Rare because it's only the second of this kind on this channel. I have to believe passionately about something to recommend it to you guys. And so it's no coincidence that both sponsorships are for the same brilliant product, this Corfix Fixing from Metex. It's a specialist fixing for dot and dab walls that I first introduced to you in a video two years ago. Link on screen now. Bottom line, on dot and dab walls, you have a gap between the plasterboard and wall that the Corfix bridges with a steel core, meaning you can fix heavy things to the wall like kitchen cabinets, flat screen TVs, radiators, that kind of thing, without having to worry about the plasterboard buckling back into the void as you tighten the screen. It was a game changer in my old day job fixing heavy things like this to the wall and so it's no surprise it's had thousands of five star reviews. Available in loads of major retailers, links will be in the description below this video. So let's dive straight into the door build. Now there are lots of ways you can construct wardrobe doors but I've always favoured the DIY faker shaker style approach. With a single 12mm base piece and then 12mm rails and styles glued and pinned to the front to create that panelled effect. I like making my doors this way rather than say with loose tenons because they're so easy to measure and construct with everyday DIY tools. And they're also incredibly strong when combined with the concealed hinges that I'll be using today. When making wardrobe doors or anything for that matter with MDF, I have four golden rules that I like to stick to. It's imperative to store your sheets of MDF flat. But if, like me, for the majority of this job, you haven't got the space to store things flat, make sure in storing them in the vertical, you have plenty of wood behind them, supporting them to prevent them warping. Your work table also needs to be completely flat. Sounds obvious, but I had two doors that I made in my daughter's bedroom where the doors sagged whilst being constructed across two sawhorses and I built that warp into the doors and they had to be remade. So I spent a painstaking half day before building these doors, making sure my work table was completely flat, screwing it together in the middle and packing underneath the sawhorse feet to counteract the uneven surface below. It's important that you paint your doors on a flat surface for exactly the same reason. And finally, it's important to construct your doors in cool conditions, preferably away from direct sunlight because I've had doors warp in these conditions in the past. It's fair to say I think that I'm paranoid about doors warping, but after sticking to these rules, none of the doors on this project have actually warped. There's one final rule to protect against warping, and that's the hinges, which we'll come on to in a bit. As my doors are inset rather than overlaid on the front of the frames, the first job was to cut 14 base pieces that fitted inside the wardrobe fronts with a two millimeter gap all the way around. To do this, I got my Urbau plunge saw back out with the 1.4 meter track guide that came with it and the 2.8 meter track that I bought for the old Evolution plunge saw that was briefly in action at the start of this project, but which spat out far too much sawdust. The top box doors were narrow enough to cut on my mitre saw, although a hand saw would suffice if you haven't got one of these. With each piece cut, I double checked the measurements by holding it in position and fine tuned any dimensions as required with my electric planer. This is why I like making doors like this, because you have the opportunity to get your measurements bang on before you glue on the panelling. The base pieces were then stored flat again until the next stage of the build. As you may recall from video one of the series, I was trying to emulate the style of these wardrobes that I saw at a client's house in the old day job. The width of your rails and styles and where you position the midbar is personal preference, but here are a few dimensions for my doors to give you an idea. To cut the styles, I started by using my circular saw with its fence, but I found that the fence wandered for the first 300 mil or so of the cut, giving the end of the style a banana-like shape, which of course was replicated from one to the next. So I would recommend to you to use the guide rail or track on your circular or plunge saw instead of the fence. To get the decorative effect on the panels, in the past I've glued pine beading onto the door. This is a great DIY trick, particularly if you don't have a router, but it's not cheap buying all that beading. And so for this job, I decided it would be interesting to see if I could route the detail into the side of the 12mm panels. 
I bought this casing square bit from Wilden Tools for my quarter inch shank Ryobi trim router and for the second time on this project I had to modify the bed of the router as existing perspex base wasn't wide enough in the centre to take the bit. So I made a new base out of plywood with an extended section to give the router more stability and prevent it rocking during each run. So how did I find this and would I recommend it to you? Well, you do have to set up a bit of a production line and you do generate a lot of dust. I filled up an entire cyclone bucket routing these doors alone, finding that the wide attachment on the vacuum was the best at catching the most dust. But this is just one attritional process in a whole job of them. So my advice to you is if you're interested in doing it, go for it. A lot of you will be wondering about the finish. Well, I'm not gonna to lie to you. It's not as good as it is with say pine, but it's not bad either. And you can make your life a lot easier by sanding the routed edge before you glue the rails themselves down to the door. I mentioned this a bit more in the painting section and there's a link to my recent video on painting NDF edges on screen now. So what about ensuring seamless joints for all those rails and styles? Well, the corner doors were tricky, trying to work out the angles and to remove the excess beading. I got the gaps as tight as I could, knowing I could fill them with my two-part wood filler. But for the rest of the doors, I decided it would be easiest to mitre the corners, not that this was completely foolproof, as my mitre saw is not particularly accurate with its 45 degree cuts. And so I developed a process of starting at one corner of the door, working around the door, fine tuning each cut to ensure all the mitered edges met as seamlessly as possible. The bottom rail of the main doors couldn't easily be mitered into the style so I just carefully measured the cut and removed the routed edge and buttered the two up to each other. It was potentially a bit tricky removing the routed edge from the styles to accommodate the middle rails but actually it was pretty easy with a chisel which I also used to fine tune the angles. For the most part I used my Japanese shakunin saw but an Irwin Jack floorboard saw would also suffice. To glue the resin stars down, on this project I used Gorilla Glue and will never be going back to the Evo stick I've used previously as Gorilla Glue is so much easier to extrude. I smoothed the glue with my Continental Filler Knife from Axis Decor. Some people would say use Mitre Bond Adhesive but I wouldn't want to use it here. I think it goes off too quickly to position these two metre long styles and I don't actually think it would give a comprehensive enough bond as I wanted the entire rail or style to be knitted to the base piece. It looks like I've used a lot of glue, but never underestimate the ability of MDF to soak up glue. In the past, I've always used panel pins and a hammer as I did here on the first top box door, recessing the nails with a punch. But I've got a bit of a confession to make. I would have been here forever pinning each of the 14 doors and Ryobi gave me a gas free 18 volt 16 gauge finish nailer over a year ago. And for this project, I bought these 20 millimeter nails for it. The speed of use and the force with which it knits the two 12 millimeter sections together has been a revelation. At 200 pounds without battery, it's not cheap, but you have to look at this as an investment and consider what you've saved on the project as a whole. Now, when you're nailing the styles to the base piece, don't, as I did, forget that you've got hinges to install. It's a good idea to mark the position of your hinges, assuming you're gonna use these concealed hinges like me, on the front of the door before you nail the styles down so that you don't accidentally nail through the exact position where you're gonna be drilling a hole with the fours in a bit. I had to remove several nails that I put in the wrong position, but didn't catch them all as we'll come on to in a bit. After scraping away the excess glue, the next job is to fill the nail holes with a two part wood filler, again, using my continental filler knife, being careful to leave the filler slightly proud of the surface, but otherwise using as little as possible. Barely 20 minutes later and the filler can then be sanded back with a 240 grit sanding sheet on my random orbit sander. This sander makes an arduous job effort free and with it connected to my vacuum, also dust free. You want a slight overhang of the rails and styles so you can plane them back to the base piece, leaving you with a crisp planed edge for both 12 mm layers. Sanding the edges is the final stage that keeps the grain much smoother when you come to painting. And so we're on to painting. I painted the small doors on the kitchen table and the larger ones on the floor of the garage with a few spare sheets of MDF under them and raised up on evenly spaced sacrificial strips of MDF below each door. As with the majority of this build, I used my favourite shellac based Zinza bin to prime the doors, followed by this water based acrylic eggshell top coat from Johnston's. Now you've seen me doing a lot of painting on this job so I'm not going to go into too much detail on that today, but what I am going to show you is some pretty cool stuff that I started using for this particular stage. Wooster, a brand I'd never used before doing this build, got in touch with me back in April to ask if I'd like to test out some of their kit. 
So for the doors, I started using their Pelican paint scuttle with its clever magnetized paintbrush holder. With their Pro Do's mini roller sleeve for the Zinza Primer Coat, along with this pretty sturdy looking roller cage and their gold edge one inch paintbrush for the routed edges. The plan being very much to saturate those edges with the shellac primer. I typically use foam roller sleeves with Zinza Bin, but the Pro Do's was an absolute joy to apply the paint with. After a single primer coat, I then lightly sanded the door edges and the decorative routed edges of the rails and styles with a small piece of 240 grit sandpaper. And it's not a bad idea to give all surfaces of the door a gentle rub down with a sanding block. And then it was onto the acrylic top coat and this red feather velour roller sleeve and Wooster's silver tip one inch brush for the routed edges. I particularly like the liners for the scuttle as I had one each for the Zinza primer coat and the top coat and kept the paint fresh in between each top coat by rollering around the top for an airtight adhesion for the cling film. I've since realized they also do a lid for the scuttle. I kept each roller sleeve wrapped in cling film in an old nut tin which kept them fresh for weeks at a time. Two top coats of the acrylic eggshell were applied to each door. Inevitably given its quality, the Wooster kit is priced near the top of the market in the same sort of bracket as Purdy, but I've honestly got to say it's the best paint finish I've ever achieved and the silky application of the paint with these paint brushes is unlike anything I've used before. I should quickly say Wooster haven't paid me anything to mention them in today's video, but they did supply me with the products free of charge. Which brings us onto the hinges. I use concealed hinges because as you'll see today, they're easier to measure, easier to install, and I think produce a much less cluttered look than you get from these professionally made wardrobes that have butt hinges. I think what puts people off concealed or Euro style hinges is knowing which ones to buy and how to install them. And I have to confess, I had to re-watch my 2017 video on this to remind myself of what I did last time. I always buy Blum hinges because of their quality and the Blue Motion range has built-in soft clothes that can be toggled on or off as required. And the first place to start for your project is their excellent brochure that literally tells you everything you need to know from what hinges and mounting plates to buy, depending on whether your doors are inset or overlaid on the frame, how many to put on the door and crucially how to install them. There's a link in the description below the video and to my 2017 video, which is a step-by-step -step guide on how to navigate the brochure. My doors being 24 millimeters thick now come under the category of thick doors. So everything I need is at page 14 of the catalog and on the basis of the guide, I bought 38 inset thick door hinges and mounting plates. That's four per main door and two per top box online back in January. Although I've since realized they do an Onyx black version that would have looked so much smarter on my doors. There are just two calculations you need to make. One, the position to bore your 35 millimeter hole on the door and two, the position to fix your hinge mounting plate in the wardrobe. For the hinge cup, it's back to that visual on page 14 of the brochure. I have the 0mm mounting plates, meaning the hinge is as close to the frame as you can get it. They do other thicknesses of mounting plate depending on your application, as you can see here. As I want a 2mm gap between door and frame, that gives me a 5mm boring distance. Add to that the radius of the drill bit, and you've got 22.5mm centre point off the door edge for the drill bit. I made this jig when I last installed these hinges, but given the centering point on the drill bit, it's not essential. The jig is only really to get the bit started, as you can see here. Trend sent me this 35mm Euro hinges snappy drill bit to try out, which you can use with or without the quick release chuck, which I actually didn't have when I drilled the hinge cups. And if anything, this drill bit was better than the Forsman bits I've used in the past and actually shows no signs of being blunted by those nails that I stupidly laid in the path of a few of the hinge cups. I checked each hinge was square to the door by checking the holes I'd marked with a combination square. A bradle ensures an accurate start point for the drill and then once piloted, I used these 3.5 by 20 millimeter stainless steel wood screws for all hinge cup and mounting plates. Hinge placement is kind of up to you, but I spaced the first hinges 100 millimeters in from the door edge and the others spaced equally down the length of the door. It's important you have the right number of hinges spaced evenly to support the door and stop it warping. That point I made at the start. For the mounting plate position on the door, for my particular hinge, you take the door thickness of 24 millimeters and add 38.5 millimeters, giving me a total of 62.5 millimeters in from the door edge. I was very keen to get a jig to standardize this positioning across all 38 hinges, but amazingly, none of the three jigs I bought online, including this one from Blum, had a 62.5 millimeter template hole. So I ended up making my own from an old bit of Perspex. An off cut from the birch ply shelving, a quick cameo from my glue gun, 
and I made some alignment and drill lines by scratching into the perspex with the tip of my knife blade, impregnating the scratch with marker pen and then cleaning it off the surface with some multi-self spray. With the screw holes drilled and one additional centre line because the first was a bit off centre and the jig was ready to go. Being perspex, the jig was a joy to align, made installing the mounting plates quick and simple and a lifesaver in the tight space down the edge of the drawers where I used a bent pin to mark the screw holes and my Weeha offset screwdriver bit to drive in the screws. I've got to say I was slightly worried about fixing the two mounting plates in this tight space for each door that had drawers inside, but the Weeha bit is such a fantastic bit of hardware it took it all in its stride. And in terms of getting the positioning of the mounting plates right in the wardrobe, you're basically mirroring the centre point of each door hinge cup onto the frame. So I simply measured all the centre points on the door and then translated those measurements onto the frame, moving them all up by 2mm to give me a 2mm gap under the door. Clicking two hinges into place like this is easy but with four it's a little bit more difficult and the trick is to line up all hinges at once and then click them into place in one movement. Sometimes you'll get a couple in and then you just have to give the last two a bit of a push to click them into position. So it's at this point with the door initially hung that the concealed or Euro style hinges really start to kick butt hinges into touch because of the three point adjustments that you can make on them are quite simply awesome. So we've got our two millimeter gap that we planned for with our hinge cut placement. If we want to reduce it or increase it we simply adjust this screw here and you can see the immediate effect that that adjustment has. It's massive. If on the other hand we want to bring the door in or out of the frame we turn to this screw here and again you can see the massive impact that this adjustment has. And finally say we want to move the door vertically we adjust these screws on the mounting plate that's why I love these mounting plates so much. Not all mounting plates come with this adjustment and then you can simply slide the door up or down on its frame. And again looking here you can see the level of adjustment that you can make. And with these onyx black mounting plates that are supplied with these hinges it's a slightly different arrangement you've got this screw here which actually moves the plate although to my mind it's a bit awkward this because you can't move every single screw simultaneously and it's not really performing as it should do anyway because this particular hinge is meant to be used in conjunction with these expando dowels which I've taken out to use on my mock-up I've got one final point to make before we move off doors that I'm actually a little bit gutted about. There's this third style of mounting plate which I've never used before but I got for this video which is brilliant because there's no profile either side of the hinge like you get with one of those. I didn't think it would be as, as adjustable but just look at this. You can insert a screw in, into the middle and move it up and down just as you can the other mounting plate and it's totally mechanical and it works well. Next time 100% I'll be using these mounting plates on my doors but the ability to make these fine adjustments is so important because you'll find once you've hung your doors that you have to move them around a surprising amount and don't be disappointed if like me you have to actually take the door off and shave some more off it in certain areas. Okay two final quick points on the doors. The first point is that with this 16 millimeter gap that we've got here between the drawers and the frame which stops the drawers clashing with the doors it is a bit tight to get your hand in if you need to release the hinge although it is easier if you take the drawers out I have had these doors off a lot so the hinges can be removable but it does make things a bit tight so I thought I'd mention it in case when you're designing yours you want to make that gap a little bit wider second point to make is that when your doors shut you need to give some thought as to what they're shutting onto and ideally you want three resting points for those concealed hinges to soft close the door onto as this could also help to stop the door warping. With these rubber pads that I bought from Amazon I've got one in the middle of the door so it soft closes silently on this shelf. I put this little block in here for both doors when they shut at the top and in hindsight I made an error at the bottom. I should have put a base piece of 18mm MDF underneath this drawer which would have raised the drawer up a bit to accommodate two more rubber stoppers at this point. So I've had to improvise with this stopper on the door itself. 
For the top boxes, I've made these stoppers, including this one angled at the back to deflect anything being pulled out. And I'm particularly proud of the arrangement in this corner box where I bought these magnetic push and open latch catchers from Amazon. I haven't screwed the magnet to the door as the soft close function on the hinges keeps it pushed against the latch without the need for a magnet. As I needed 12 knobs for these wardrobes, I wanted something that looked smart, classical to match the design, but also inexpensive. And so Armangu Direct, who I've used a lot on this project, came to the rescue again with their large range of inexpensive knobs. And after fairly exhaustive sampling what they had to offer, we came up with this Old Forge Redford knob, I think a bargain at £1.73 each. I should point out they supplied me with these knobs free of charge. And so we're on to the lighting and I've had a bit of a nightmare with this if I'm honest. The sensor switches, which you'll recall I installed in video 3 of the series, work with your hand, they work with a bit of wood, pretty much anything you throw at it, but what they don't like is the colour of these doors. Let me explain. So just to demonstrate the problems I'm having, a bit of a yellow tape, the light switch is off. Black tape in exactly the same place, the light does not switch off. And finally, a bit of white tape there, and the light switches off. And so, with no help from Sensio, who have declined to respond to any of my requests for help on this, I've resorted to painting a small square of the emulsion paint I've used on the walls on the exact spot on the door that the sensor hits. And now the sensor works perfectly. It is annoying having this bizarre spot on each door, but at least the problem is fixed. Moral of the story, if you want to use these sensor switches with your wardrobes, don't paint your wardrobes this colour. The plinth skirting was pretty much the final job which I made from a piece of the 25 by 100 millimeter plain redwood that I bought from buildingmaterials.co.uk at the start of this project. The plank wasn't quite long enough to span the entire space, so I routed a groove with my quarter inch shank biscuit cut router bit and PVA glued an additional section strengthened with a biscuit joint. To compress the joint I used my old wedge clamp, such a fantastic old fashioned way to achieve a really tight clamp in tricky situations like this. Being the idiot I am, I managed to cut too much off the skirting and had to glue a further shorter piece on at a later stage. Using these swanky scribes I discovered during the project, I scribed the mad dip on my floor into the skirting. I then removed the scribe section with my jigsaw and then fine tuned the cut with my vintage Stanley block plane and electric planer. I then routed a bull nosed edge on the top edge of the skirting, again with my Ryobi quarter inch shank trimmer out a bit, with a bit of inevitable fine tuning to get the height exactly right. And then primed the skirting with Zinza bin, followed by two top coats of the acrylic eggshell. I thought long and hard about the best way to fix the skirting, tempted to use my glue gun, but concerned about the glue leaving a gap between skirting and plinth. So in the end, I fixed the skirting in place with 3.5 by 49 mm lost tight screws, filled and gently sanded the tiny holes left by the screws, and then repainted the skirting with a couple of further eggshell coats, not bothering to prime first. I was nearly done. The final job was to put a second coat of paint on the fascia with some tricky cutting in to the ceiling which was made a little easier with this 51mm Ultra Pro cutting in brush again from Wooster. I just had this mirror to install purchased from B&Q which involved cutting down the screws supplied to suit my 24mm doors. And I also bought this ladder on Amazon to access the top boxes. Oh, and I bought all the hangers that you've seen from Hanger World. So that's it, I'm finally at the end of this monster project. Thank you for sitting through that very long video. I'm sorry it was so long, but I felt like there's no point doing these videos if I don't give you all the steps and all the thinking behind everything that I did. Inevitably, there are things that I could have gone into more detail on. I'm still intrigued to know how well this paint finish will last long term. Clearly an oil based finish would have been more durable but would have been totally impractical with all that extra drying time for this many units to paint. And I've had people commenting recently that to make these water based type paints more durable you can use things like Minwax Polycrylic Protective Finish Somebody used that for their kitchen units and somebody else used polyvine decorators varnish as well. So those are things to look into. Maybe let me know in the comment section below if there are suggestions that you've got 
for projects like this where you're working extensively with water-based paints. The other thing I've missed out today is the total project build cost. I am gonna pull that together, but I'm anxious to get this video out today. It would have just taken too long to go through all the receipts. Clearly, I should have done it at the time. But look out for that because that will come out at some point in the future, either through my community tab or my Patreon channel when I finally get around to setting that up or otherwise. Don't forget all the tools referred to in today's video and the rest of the project will be in the description below this video, which obviously you can access on your smartphone by clicking on the little arrow and on your PC by clicking on the show more button. If you've liked today's video, it'd be fab if you could give it a thumbs up below. And finally, as I always say, if you're new to my channel, it would mean so much to me to have you subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here. And don't forget to click the bell notification icon so you get notified of all my future uploads. Thanks for watching and see you soon.